Um, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, it's been a very exciting, very interesting day. I, I, I truly enjoyed it. And um, um, I heard about PCDH19 by Renzo Guerrini about a year ago. Uh, well, a little bit more than that. And I was totally amazed by something that came out a lot today, which is the extremely odd inheritance pattern of, of, of the disease. At that time, we were working uh, on rat syndrome, um, which is, again, uh, a disease um, of a, uh, caused by a mutation of gene on the X chromosome. And so we thought that we, we could contribute uh, by, <coughs> by using some tools that we have been developing in the last four years for a rat syndrome study. And um, uh, this is what I'm going to talk about the, very briefly. I, I, I will discuss this point only very briefly because they've been already very well dissected by the people that preceded me. And I will basically tell you what we are trying to do in terms of creating a mosaic system of PC, uh, PCDH19 expression where cells have been tagged, like you have seen, uh, by but by fluorescent proteins in such a way that we, by using single cell technologies like uh, uh, two-photon imaging, uh, targeted patch clamp, and electrophysiology, we can actually study the behavior of neurons uh, in vivo inside the, the cortex of, of the mouse, trying to hope, trying to hope uh, to imagine a way of unraveling why Moses is, is actually so crucial for some component of the disease, especially the uh, epileptic uh, phenotype. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have seen this already. The, uh, the female patients uh, are a mosaic due to the inactivation of, of the X chromosome. Uh, half cells are, let's say, white type. Half cells are actually mutated. Um, and uh, uh, as far as I know, in, in most females, uh, uh, roughly the rate of mutation is close to 50%. And that brings about the phenotype of the disease the way we, we know it. Uh, the fact that there is an expression mosaic actually has lots of experimental implication. If you are interested in the properties of single neurons, and if you're interested to study that in vivo rather than an in vitro, uh, an in vitro system, because uh, Whatever neuronal uh, and circuitry uh, uh, property you study, you always have, have to ask yourself if that impairment you see is caused directly by the mutation, uh, if the cell carries the mutation, or if that comes from the fact that the entire ecosystem of the brain has actually been, uh, been altered. And a very complicating factor is that when you are doing your study, you really don't know what is the genotype, uh, the genotype of the cell. Uh, I said that uh, uh, our tools are directed at the studying properties level of single neuron. Um, nobody has shown this, so, so I, I will show you. You can actually open a window on the brain and by, and by using uh, uh, two-photon microscopy, which is now a very well-established uh, uh, well, very well established tool. You can actually study the level of single cell or even a, a, a subcellular resolution what is actually happening in the brain, with the idea of answering the uh, never <laughs> trivial question that we all have in our uh, um, personal relationship. What the hell do you have in your mind? <laughs> so the idea is that you, I mean, if you can put the right fluorescent molecule inside the right cells into the brain, you can actually open a window. This is a, a cranial window in a mouse. It, it is about uh, three millimeters in diameter. These are the superficial blood vessel. But every single bit you see here is actually a neuron that in this case has been targeted um, with, uh, with a sensor for intracellular concentration of chloride. I'm not going to talk about that, uh, but just to tell you that you can all, not only see the resolution uh, with high resolution structure of the neuron, but you can also uh, study um, the functional properties um, of, of, of the neuron. Um, the kind of resolution you can have, it is actually uh, demonstrated uh, in, this, uh, in this short movie. This is a trip of about 20 micron thickness inside the brain. The resolution is quite high. The field is only 25 microns in width, and you can see dendrites, axons, etc. And I stress it, this is a perfectly live mouse that is sitting under the microscope under uh, soft an an anesthesia. 
Uh, and this is a projection of what you've seen. These are dendrites. Each one of these objects is called dendritic spine. I will talk about it in a second. And they are uh, excitatory synapses is the, uh, let's say, the optical signature of the postsynaptic side of the excitatory synapse. You can also see axons here, are axons with the presynaptic terminal and, uh, and, and so on. Um, dendritic spines are very much uh, of interest for us. Uh, they are these little spines that sticks out from neurons and they suddenly became extremely important in the 50s when by electron microscopy has been demonstrated that basically each one of them carry a synapse. So each dendritic spine is really the computational unit of the brain, if you wish. And um, a very important fact about uh, uh, learning, memory, and uh, the development of, of, of the brain circuitry is that these structures are extremely uh, plastic, so they change shape, they are continuously formed, and uh, they are continuously retracted, and this plastic process is very much related to the establishment of circuitry and with memory and learning. And, and to prove that point, I'm showing you a small movie, which uh, is uh, one hour in the life uh, of, of an dendrite, and uh, you can see that there is lots of movement of, of, of the structure. You can see they come out, they come out. The, the, the brain is deeply alive. I mean, I, uh, my colleagues I have seen this kind of movies many times. Maybe um, the, the, the parents of the kid have not. Uh, it is amazing to see how much uh, plasticity uh, of, of shape uh, there is into the brain, how much things change. This is just one hour. Uh, in the life uh, of this uh, specific uh, mouse. So, at that time we were studying Rett syndrome and we were very interested to see if early, early, early on, uh, during the uh, postnatal life of, of, of the rat mouse, we could actually detect uh, a phenotype of the disease at the level of the, uh, of the dendritic spines. Um, uh, Red syndrome uh, in the classic form is caused by the mut mutation, the loss of the gene MCP2, which is localized in, in the nucleus, is a, let's say is a controller of gene expression, it's not very important what it does now. And since it is on the X chromosome, it is actually characterized by mosaicism. This is the immunostaining for MCP2, which appears like this little dot inside the cell nucleus. Um, when you have an heterozygous fi females, you see cells that have a no kind of normal MCP2 staining, but you see cells that are basically no staining, and that's the expression of mosaicism, at least for this disease. Um, the fact that uh, uh, it, is, uh, it is so strong, the mosaicism actually, as I said, is a real complication in terms of, of, of studying the process, because you don't know um, if the cell is a wild-type cell, or if it is actually uh, a, no, a, a mutated cell. So what people have been doing in study of MCP2, and we were not an exception in that, is to study a homozygous male, that, so it is co a complete knockout for MCP2, homozygous male that in human are actually not, uh, uh, pregnancy is not ba basically uh, brought to termination, um, but uh, mice, just demonstrated that actually mice do not need the brain Actually, the males are uh, uh, about, they last about four to five, five weeks. And we studied the enretic spines in the, uh, in the control mice. And you see there is lots of motility. So the, the color coding codified two different frames of, of, of this movie. So where you see the red or green, that means there's been a massive change in within 45 minutes. And you can see that most dendritic spines actually are either green or red to, to indicate the very large degree of uh, structural plasticity that there is in a young, uh, uh, in a young mouse. Uh, if you do the same in a rat mouse, we demonstrated that the, there is a massive decrease in, in plasticity. Now, this is not a correct model because, as I said, this is a homozygous. And at that time, so that was about uh, five years ago, we really had a dream which was to be able to perform the same experiment in a mosaic model, but in a way that we could actually uh, understand what is the genotype of the cell at the time of the experiment, not a posteriori by using immunistochemistry or, or something like that. Um, 
PCDH19, we have seen, has a very, very peculiar uh, genetics, um, which uh, basically uh, has been demonstrated by, uh, as, as Nicola has shown, by two very recent paper and the last recent paper, there are very few cases in which males uh, actually display a mosaic, and these males actually have a phenotype that resembles very much the phenotype of, of, of the females. So this is an indication that the presence of the, of the two different system of neurons, wild type and, uh, um, and mutated, uh, actually uh, are essential for at least the, uh, some of the feature of the disease. Um, in males, mosaicism has a different characteristic than females because it's not due to the inactivation of the X chromosome. And in fact, depending on the tissue in which has been tested, uh, the mosaicism rate has been found varying between 10 and 90%, if I'm not wrong. So 10% of mutated cell or 10% of, of, of normal cells. Uh, that also suggests that even a small percentage of white type cells actually might be enough uh, to uh, push the phenotypes toward the deep epileptic uh, phenotype we, we have seen in the past. Uh, the model that has been presented uh, that might explain that is the interference model in which there might be different patterns of connection between white type and, and, mutated, and mutated neurons with a spatial distribution we totally ignore. So our dream uh, was, and as still is, to be able this mosaic, which is so nicely reproducible on the PowerPoint presentation, to actually produce inside the mouse, uh, and in such a way that we can actually go on the two-photon microscope, place our electrodes onto the cell, and, and study the, the, the properties of, of, of the single cell. Um, we thought that doing something like that would have been really very, very easy, uh, but we wanted the model to actually respond to three very stringent criteria. Uh, first of all, we want to be able to control the rate of mutation. Uh, the second thing is that we want each cell to express a fluorescent protein that is telling you what is the genotype of the cell. And the fluorescent reporter must be absolutely faithful. I mean, there must be no space for error, okay? So it's not like, well, in 70% of cases, we the, the, the green cells are mutated or, no. It must be an absolutely, um, an absolutely stringent system, at least as much as it can be done. It turned out actually uh, not to be such an easy thing to do. And what I would like to do next uh, is, is to give an idea of, of the procedure we actually followed. So there will be some technical uh, argument I will follow, and I hope it's not going to be too boring, and I hope to be able to explain it in a kind of, of, of clear way. Uh, so the technology um, to take off a gene or to change the color of fluorescent protein, you need to work on the DNA of that gene or on the DNA of the, of the fluorescent protein. There are many different ways in which you can do that. One of the simplest in certain ways and classic way of doing it is by using the Cradlock system. What is that? Um, you can add small sequences which are called log p sequences to a piece of DNA, so this is a piece of DNA, and you can insert two of these sequences. When this DNA uh, is, uh, uh, is, is then tran, um, uh, uh, transported to its pro protein transcript, what you have is that these objects do not contribute at all to the, to the protein. So the protein is going to turn out to be a perfectly normal protein. But this basically are acting as tags, and they can be recognized by a specific enzyme, the cry enzyme, the cry recombinase enzyme. And this enzyme actually is doing some very interesting stuff on, on, on the gene that is inside the, the, uh, the LOXP uh, sequences. Uh, it can do two things. The LOXP sequences uh, have a direction because so they are uh, almost completely, but not totally palindrome, so you can read them in the direction. If you read them in the opposite direction, they're a little bit different. So that's why they are represented as, as, as an arrow. If the LOXP sequences are uh, oriented in this direction, so they have a congruent direction, in presence of the query combinase enzyme, what happens is that the enzyme takes these two bits here, recombines them, at the very end, the product of, of the activity of these enzymes on the DNA is the excision 
the deletion of the portion of the gene that inside the two sequences. So basically, this is a way in which you can take off the gene because you can put in there something very important for the protein, something essential. You take it out, uh, and uh, the um, either you have a truncated protein that is not functional, or you, you, that can actually abolish completely the expression of the protein, depending on the architecture of where you are actually going to place the, the lost protein site. But this is very important. All it happens if prairie combinase is present in that specific cell. Uh, and this is the technology with, what, uh, with which the conditional mice are made. Uh, you take uh, the lock speed sequence, you target the gene with two lock speed sequences, and in presence of prairie combinases, you can actually kill the, the, the gene, and that mouse becomes, at that point, a knockout or mutant for that specific gene. You can do something different if you change the orientation of, of the locks besides. Let's forget the technical details and why there are two of them. And uh, inside, you can actually put two pieces of DNA with two different orientations. One piece of DNA is going to be uh, oriented correctly. It, it, this is so-called the incense uh, orientation. And you can have enhanced sense orientation, so a piece of gene that is oriented the opposite way. When this gene is transduced, this protein is going to be expressed, but not this one, because it's not recognized. It's if you try to read the text from left to the right, but then you have words that are written the other way around, you simply don't recognize them, and you stop. Because what the hell is that uh, reading, and you just stop. Okay? That's exactly the same thing that happens. <laughs> the beauty of it is that if primary combinases operates on this DNA, what happens is that as a result of this operation, the piece inside is actually rotated. That means that what was in anti-sense before now becomes in sense. Now, you can you may notice that these are red and green, okay? And the reason is that if here you have a protein, a, a gene that expresses a fluorescent protein that shines in red light, the cell that expresses this gene actually will shine in red light, but the cell that actually expresses the recombined gene will be green. So this is one of the early architecture that we kind of, uh, we kind of worked with uh, because we thought that we could have uh, a, a green gene, a red gene, one is inverted, so we simply switch the color depending by the operation of, 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 pre, of prairie communities. Okay? So how do we do uh, our model? First of all, we need to start from a conditional, uh, let's say, knockout mutant mouse for PCDH19, and that is the mouse that Maria and Silvia have been developing in Milan, and that I am happy to report that they are happily reproducing right now. So th these mice have been, they have become Italian only for a few months, so you know, it take a while. But eventually, the, the romantic, the Italy, thanks God, is very romantic. That's not a good thing. <laughs> yeah, it's the only good thing about Italy, and uh, <laughs> so hopefully we'll have a nice, uh, have a nice um, we are going to create the mosaic by having what we say is a sparse activation of prairie combinase. I, I will show you exactly how that can be done, okay? But it can actually be done. And then the genotype of the cell is going to be revealed by the uh, fluorescent machine that I will show you in, 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 a, in a second. And how we are going to put prairie combinase and the fluorescent machine inside the inside the, the brain? We'll either do by viral transduction or by in utero electroporation. I will show you examples coming from a utero electroporation uh, experiment, but we are also having viruses done that should be ready. I've been told in two weeks' time. Okay. So this is the first machine that we actually have designed. It, it is actually the third one, but forget all the. Uh, toils and troubles we went through. So we have a red fluorescent protein, in, uh, the gene of a uh, uh, red fluorescent protein in sense, uh, the gene of a green fluorescent protein in antisense. In white, in absence of prairie combinase activity, the cells shine in red. In presence of prairie combinase activity, the, the, the cells should be green. We thought that this would have worked and was great. Actually, it does not work, uh, as I will show you in a second. It works only in one condition. Well, if, when you don't have any creativity, cells are actually perfectly red. If you have lots of prey recombinase activity, cells are all perfectly green. But this is useless. Why? Because we want to make a mosaic. 
to make a mosaic, we can't have query combinates in every single cell, okay? Otherwise, we have no mosaic. So what you have to do is to, you have to put a very small level of query combinates. You can do by in utero electroporation by using a very small concentration of the plasmid that encodes for query combinates, or by putting very few uh, viral particles expressing query combinates, okay? That's the way you do it. But that means that you don't have much query combinates in the cells at all. And when you actually do <coughs> an experiment in that condition, that is what you're going to find out. You're going to find out cells are red, cells that are green, but you're going to find out lots of cells are yellow. Why is that? Because you don't have much activity. That means you have many copies of the, of the plasmid of the cells inside the cell, and not all the copies are uh, re recombined. Okay? That means that if there is no certainty of the full recombination of the plasmid, there is even less certainty of the actual recombination of, of the genomic uh, uh, NOx site. Keep in mind that in a cell there might be hundreds of copies of the plasmid, but there is only one copy of the NOx site in the genome, which are protected by the chromatin that will actually be much harder to recombine than the, uh, than the plasmid. Uh, Anyway, in collaboration with Laura Canceta in Genoa, we did try in vivo, so this is a section of the cortex which has been transfected with the uh, sensor for recombination, and you can see that there are green cells, red cells, but there are really plenty of yellow cells. So something like that simply does not work because it will not create a mosaic in which you have certainty of what the genome actually, actually is. So, um, at that point, we started thinking uh, about this fact that let's say we have a single cell, and this is the level of reactivity, so we basically can correlate somehow with the concentration of the query combinized enzyme inside the cell. When the concentration is very high, you have a saturation and you have 100% of recombination. So you are recombining on the plasmid, you are recombining the genome. When you have zero reactivity, of course, you have no recombination whatsoever. The problem is that there is a gray area in the middle where you can have not complete recombination, uh, and uh, that is, of course, very bad, because this is the area in which you, you are basically making a mistake. Okay? The idea is that what we would like to have is a sensor that either uh, a situation in which either you don't have any recombination whatsoever or you have absolutely saturating recombination, okay? This is the ideal situation. And uh, I mean, we went through lots of different thoughts in how this could be done, but eventually we started thinking that this area here is actually quite interesting. So when we have very, very, very little creativity, uh, there is a sort of uh, intrinsic quantization of the process. This is what I mean, that you can have zero copy of, of the plasmid, of cryo combination in a cell, you can have one copy, you can have two copies, you can have three copies, but there is no such a thing as 0 0.5 copies of the plasmid. And we thought, okay, what happens if we try to amplify this very low level of activity and we transform it in a saturating event? If we would be able to do that, actually, this would be our threshold. Either we don't have any plasmid, or we have just one copy of the plasmid. The point is, how can we amplify this? Um, in certain terms, this looks very much like an action potential is, is formed in a neuron. An action potential is formed because once sodium channel starts opening up, the neuron depolarizes, more sodium channels open up, and you have a stereotypic response of the neuron. So th that is what we wanted to create in our thing. So we modified our uh, tool in this way. Here we have again the red fluorescent protein. Here we have the green fluorescent protein. But in the anti-sense portion of the sensor, we hide. We have been hiding a copy of query combinase itself. So what is the idea? The idea is that if you have even a single event of recombination, the new plasmid that is formed starts expressing query combinates. And what it does is start recruiting other plasmids that have not been uh, 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 recombined yet. So it self-amplifies this process. In other words, this is truly uh, a DNA-based uh, DNA amplifier, basically. 
uh, and it is regenerative in the sense that as soon as the amplification starts, it grows, it grows, it grows, all the way to saturation. So uh, a way of describing this is with this model. So these are the red rings are plasmids. So li the little pieces of DNA we have put with our, uh, which is our sensor, and this is the genome. Okay. So the gene, in this case, the PCDH19 gene, is enclosed in the two log speed uh, uh, situation. Um, if you have a very low level of prior recombinase, what might happen is that only a few plasmids are recombined, but all the others are not, and the genome may be or may not be recombined, likely is not going to be recombined. And this cell is going to shine in yellow light because there, are, there is some red protein and some green fluorescent protein. Okay? With the new sensor, this is what happens. When you have a very low level of, of, of gray activity, you're going to have the same low level of recombination. But once you have recombined this to plasmid, more cry recombinases is going to be uh, synthesized by the cell, produced by the cell. And of course, each molecule of cry recombinase is going to recruit uh, more and more plasmids. And at the very end, this is going to lead to a full saturating bar of creativity, and that, of course, is going to lead to the full recombination of the uh, genome. So I will show you now very rapidly uh, the evidence that this system actually works. So this is in vivo transfection in normal wild-type mice. Um, and uh, the way the, the in utero uh, transfection has been done has been by transfecting a uh, high concentration of, of the sensor, of the fluorescent sensor, and a very low concentration of prairie recombinants. Here we have one part of prairie recombinants for every 500 parts of, of the fluorescent sensor. And you can see here that cells really nicely segregate. They're either green or red. And this is, in this graph, uh, each symbol represents a cell. This is the red fluorescence. This is the green fluorescence. When a cell is only red, that means it's a wild type cell. When it's only green, that is a, a mutated cell. And this is the distribution uh, of the cell in the two different directions. So with a very, very small concentration of prey, which is, as I said, one part over 500 of, of the sensor, you still have 77% of efficiency of, of recombination, just to indicate the amplification of the system. We did that at a ridiculously homeopathic uh, concentration of cryocombinase, so it's one part of cryocombinase every 5,000 parts of, of the sensor, and you can see that there is a small population recombined cell, and this is about 30% recombination. So we think we can actually, uh, we, we titrated that on the number of animals, it's very reproducible, we can actually titrate our mosaic uh, basically, by selecting the relative contribution of, of the two of, of the two plasmids, this is an experiment that uh, that has been tried also in cultured cell. Carlo Sala that sits there did this experiment together with Carlo Raffaelli in Milan, Milan, and this is a wild type neuron, and this is uh, a neuron where prairie combinase operated. This is an astrocyte. There is no prairie combination because the promoter of prairie combinase was actually a neuronal promoter which also is interesting because that means we can actually target different cells based on the promoter that we put on the query combination. So we can target, for example, with have mutation only of fast spiking interneurons just by putting the query combination under the proper uh, uh, promoter for fast spiking interneurons, which would be the parvalgumin promoter. Uh, this is a movie. This is a 300 micron trick inside the brain, and this is an MSCP2 floxed mouse. So in this case, actually, the color reports the presence or not of MSCP2, OK? So this is not just a, a nice way of looking at the neuron, but you are actually looking at the, at the genome of, of, of the neuron. Uh, the, the mouse, as I said, is a perfectly, uh, is, is, is a anesthetized mouse under the microscope, but you can really reconstruct the circuitry uh, in nice details of, uh, in the system. This is a projection of that. Keep in mind, this green cell is not just a pretty green cell, but this is a cell that has lost the MSCP2 protein, and these cells are wild type cell, uh, wild type cells. Next year, or whenever, there will be another meeting. Uh, uh, if you have not been uh, bored by me, I, I hope I'll be able to show the same thing, except uh, with the uh, PCDH16 uh, mice. 
um, this is very important slide. Uh, we did a, a retrospective uh, um, immunohistochemistry for MSCP2, and this is the content of MSCP2 fluorescence in red cells, wh where there has not been very common as activity, and in green cell. And you can actually see that the changing color of the cell actually is a reporter of, of the change in, in the genotype. And you can see that you actually see the dendritic spines really nicely. Uh, again, this is the MSCP2 mouse, but uh, that will be done also with the um, PCDH19 uh, mouse. And this is the mosaicism uh, percentage in function of the relative concentration of, of the two plasmid, and you can do a nice uh, uh, titration of, of the system. So what we are going to do? Um, we are going to have an on-demand model of PCD, uh, PCDH19 mosaic. Um, one aspect I think is in interesting that it is sort of floated around now, which may have to do, for example, with the fact in maize, is that the mosaic can actually be quite focal. I mean, if it is really late, you can, in line of principle, you can have only a few columns of, of, of mutations, which actually leads to a very localized uh, uh, mosaicism for PCDH19, uh, sort of resembling what may happen in focal uh, cortical dysplasia. I think this would be a really interesting thing to do. Just by titrating the injection, you can actually easily model this sort, uh, uh, this sort of, of behavior. Uh, this model will allow you to t uh, will allows us to test the hypothesis as the basis of the interference model. I mean, you can easily imagine to do patch clamp on a red neuron with a red neuron to start their connectivity on the red and the green neuron and all the possible combination you can do. Um, you can use uh, uh, optical sensor to do single cell physiology in many cells at once. I will just repilogate what we intend to do. Of course, is to study. Uh, a sort of, uh, I like to call it genotype and time-resolved anatomy. Time-resolved because you can study, for example, the dynamic processes leading to brain circuitry, but it's also genotype-resolved because now you actually know the genotype of that specific cell, and uh, certainly studying the uh, dendritic spines seems to be an absolutely necessary thing, uh, thing to do. Uh, you can study neuronal activity in basic condition and during epileptic seizure. You, you can re this is just to give you an idea about the experiment is done. This is the mouse. I know it's not the very, doesn't look very, very clear, but the, the blue light here is fluorescence that is excited on the mouse head. The mouse is uh, fixed under the, the microscope. It is actually a behaving mouse, so this is not an anesthetized mouse. Uh, there is a, a white cylinder and the mouse uh, can run on the cylinder. It thinks that is around that runs uh, happily, uh, but instead it's staying still. So you can actually do uh, macroscopy on it and um, you can also record uh, the local field potential with this electrode right here. And these are caesium which have been evoked uh, in this specific mouse. Uh, and this is the electrophysiology, the local field recording, and this is the spectral analysis of the same, the same caesium. And you can do calcium imaging. That means that you can ask to every single neuron what it is doing during the caesium. Keep in mind that uh, to do this, this is a calcium imaging, of course. So there is a fluorescent molecule that uh, increases the fluorescence when calcium goes up. That means that that neuron is actually producing action potential, so that neuron is being activated. So you can see here a critical phase of, 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 uh, of a short uh, uh, burst. It's obviously a scissor, but this sort is a short burst. You can actually do that while at the same time you have the two fluorescent proteins. There are ways of doing it, okay? And, and we do it routinely. Uh, so you can actually ask yourself, are the mutated cell more epileptic than the normal mutated cell? It is perfectly possible that actually the mutated cells act as a sort of single cell focus that actually starts some uh, epileptic activity that spreads this entire network. And we hope to be able to answer to this, I think, important questions uh, with, with, with these tools. Uh, you can study correlation uh, because synchrony and the synchronization, of course, is extremely important, not just for epilepsy, but it's extremely important for the cognitive processing that the brain operates. And, um, and, and uh, yeah, these are, um, this again is a calcium imaging experiment, and, and these matrices here are measure of coherence between different neurons. So, again, you can actually envision to study coherence between the different classes of neurons depending on their, uh, on their genotype. 
this is the most important slide of all. <laughs> the molecular work, uh, yeah, you have a very unfortunate last name. Uh, Ratto in Italian means rat. Uh, which is, yeah, very unfortunate. Ricardo and uh, Francesco, they actually are sitting down back there, are the extremely talented molecular biologists that uh, manufacture the sensor. And uh, Silvia, Marco, and, and Luigi have been working on, on, on the physiology. Um, all this would not happen without the collaboration with Maria Passafaro and Silvio Bassani in Milan, uh, Carlo Sala and Chiara Verpelli, Claudio Ludovic in Padua, and Laura Cangetta in general. Thank you very much. Questions for Dr. Rat? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hello, I'm Joni. I'm a parent. This is my husband, a parent. Hi. Uh, a 12-year-old um, girl. Wow, she was just diagnosed um, in October, so we're quite new to understanding and gathering information. Um, and I know that this is very scientific today and very, I mean, very, very well done, and, and thank you for, for explaining this to us. But. Um, and this may be off your topic, but um, I wrote this down a little bit here. Um, I know behavior and quality of life is very hard to measure, and typically um, scientists like yourselves um, generally don't do elaborate studies on the behavior and the quality of life. So for, for years, we have been noticing that leading up to a seizure, we get very um, bad days of behavior, almost like she has two personalities. And then she, she clusters for two and three days. So something in there releases, something builds up and then releases and then we have our wonderful girl back. Am I explaining that right? And so, yeah. Yeah, like, w what is possibly building up? You know, and it, it seems like what you guys have all been talking about the last, uh, you know, eight hours here almost supports, like, some kind of change. And then you, you the seizures go for three days, and it's, and then it's, yeah, released, or maybe it's the opposite. You know, maybe like something's being depleted and then seizures and then it kind of like repairs or something. I'll just chime in that you're not alone. I, I, we Some of our patients have the same exact experience. I'm sure others can comment uh, as well, so. Um. Well, I, I, I mean, uh. When I was at school, I wanted to be an astronomer. So I, you know, I'm a little bit out, really out of my depth, and uh, I'm not a neurologist, obviously. Uh, but there are th some thinking, okay, that uh, I might. Uh... So, for example, sleep disturbances is something I would look carefully into, and uh, I, I have no idea how we sleep uh, in, in these kids. And uh, but um, in, in many models we have in the lab. We noticed that um, when you anesthetize the mouse, uh, you have the electroencephalogram as a very beautiful rhythm, which is called slow wave activity, okay? We, 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 uh, which is a very important component of the healthy sleep, let's put it that way. And in many of the, of the models we, we have in the lab, and not, I'm not talking about the PCDH19 because we, we are still developing it, we actually see alteration of that. And um, if you have poor sleep, I mean, we don't know exactly why we sleep, but there are many important things that might be happening. There might be metabolic clearances of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, of substances produced during uh, daily activity. Uh, there is also sort of metabolic clearances of, of synapses in the sense that uh, during, during the day there are plastic changes undergoing the brain that are somehow renormalized during correct sleep. Okay, and whoever ever experienced uh, a sleep deprivation, for example, knows that there is an accumulation of the effect of sleep deprivation. So I don't know. I might be totally stupid, and I, I would love if uh, uh, if one real doctor uh, would say something. But uh, 
sleep disturbances, I, that is definitely something I would look into. I mean, if there are alterations, for example, DAG during, during the night, then may actually be an indication of the fact that could be a factor. There could be hormonal factor. Uh, the way you describe it looks like an accumulation of some metabolic factors so, so in, in a way, but I, I don't know if I make any sense at all. Is, uh, uh, is there any pattern of, of, of sleep disturbance in, in this kid, um, in the period that is leading to, to a cluster, for example? No, I, I, I don't think any of our kids sleep well, so it's a very difficult question to answer. Um, but this whole pre-ictal phenomenon, I mean, it's another area of research, right? People are looking at identifying minutes before a seizure where something is happening, hour, and people are truly trying to push this. But it's something we clearly see in our Dravet syndrome population as well, where they'll have horrible, horrible seizures. And in the weeks that follow that horrible episode of seizures, they're the clearest they can ever be. It really is, to your analogy, sort of a storing up, a release, and then a reset. And I certainly don't understand it, so. But Joseph just picked up the microphone, so. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we want answers, not questions. <laughs> <laughs> Those you need to ask questions, otherwise you don't know what to that's answer. That's absolutely true, and that's absolutely true, I agree. So y your system looks looks really good and very elegant and I see the challenge but how early you can go to, to, to actually start manipulating it so actually you know that you're addressing the developmental aspect of the disease as well as the function uh, I mean I, I think it's a beautiful question but it's very difficult to, to answer uh, with in uterine electroporation um, you know in the mouse you can electroporate four days before delivery, which means that you are going to target layer, supragranular layer, basically, so layer two and three of the cortex. And in fact, the data I showed you are all pyramidal cells from layer two and three. And you cannot target interneurons because we've never been able to target interneurons within uterine electroporation. One thing we would like to try to do uh, is to do the same uh, by doing in utero uh, viral transfection, okay, which, I mean, has been done. Uh, I don't see why it should not work. And that actually might also be good to target the, the, the interneurons. And that is definitely something we, we are going to try. Certainly it's not like having a transgenic mouse in which you're going to put Cray in the right place, the sensor in the right place. You can envision to do that by manufacturing the proper mice, manufacturing the proper control, there is still the problem of controlling Cray and so on. But still, I think it would be extremely interesting, and it relates with something I, was, I asked Paul this morning, to see if in a perfectly normal adult mouse, and then we do the conditional knockout in an adult mouse, and we see if we see alteration of synaptic transmission, because there might be something also, not, I mean, w w with the rat syndrome, it happened the same thing because we always thought it was just a neurodevelopmental disease. But then, when uh, uh, Yuda Zogby did the, co took the conditional mouse and did the knocking out of MSCP2 in the adult, she saw a phenotype emerging. But there was a perfectly normal brain with perfectly normal developmental things. So I think this is another very important question we should ask about PCDH19. So I think all these models are all extremely important. And the answer is not going to be provided by a single model, by maybe the combination of, of all of these models. Thanks for that talk, a really elegant system. Um, what's the time period that you can uh, do these experiments over? So in other words, if you do the electroporation during uh, development, how late can you look? Sort of the opposite to Joseph's question. And, and does the sensor maintain its activity? But being a plasmid, could it be lost from the cell? So do you retain that ability to identify positive and negative cells? Uh, with the uterine electroporation, the mice you have seen, the images you have seen, they were adult. So that means uh, over w between one and two months of age. Okay, and uh, we are doing lots of work with, uh, I mean, it's a different work, of course, but uh, about to photon imaging of chloride concentration, and uh, we. The older we have kept them, we are two months, and there is actually a decline in the expression, but you, you can still work with that. 
Uh, it, it depends what experiment you want to do. If you want to look at dendritic spines, you need very high expression to be able to see them. But if you just want to identify the genotype of the cell to do, let's say, calcium imaging experiment, you don't care. You, you can go uh, very low. So you, you can all certainly go to one, two months of age. Vice versa, how early you can see deficit, which is also very important, uh, for uh, with the with a uterine operation at P4, P5, already you have very nice expression, very nice expression. Of course, to see the, I mean, you have to take in account also the decline of the protein that has to do with the fact that you do the excision, but then you have to wait for the degradation of the RNA, the degradation of the protein. So that is going to change a little bit depending on the specific uh, gene you're going to target and also on the property of the fluorescent proteins. For example, red fluorescent protein are harder to degrade than green fluorescent protein. So the cell is uh, lo would lose green fluorescence more rapidly than the red fluorescence. So there, there is some trickery in, into it, but, uh, but you can, uh, the, the window actually you, you can use is pretty large. I would say it's about two months from, let's say, P5 all the way to two, two months, if you do in utero. If you do with, uh, with, with the viral transduction, well, it, you know, it depends when you do the, the injection. And so I've attempted. Thank you, everyone. We're